Hi, my name's Duncan, and we are just delighted to be sharing this new course with you for FPNA professionals. As you can see from the name of this model on the screen, we're going to be teaching you exactly how to build a model template like this one that we can use for monthly FPNA analysis. Now, one of the most exciting things about this course is that we're going to be teaching you all of the Excel formulas and functions that we've used to build up this great looking model template. We're also going to be going through the design of this model. And in particular, what is unique about it is that often financial models will have one tab for the inputs, another tab for the model or the calculations, and a third tab for the outputs. But in this model design, we have included inputs, calculations, and outputs all together in one model tab. For instance, as you can see down here, we have a bunch of inputs going across here and a number of calculations above. And finally, up in this area of the graph here, we have all of the output sheets. And the reason that we've done this is that as we're making changes to the numbers, we need to see exactly how things are moving on these graphs so that we can help us analyze the monthly data. The other things that you may be really excited to learn on this course are things like this. For instance, here we have a nice toggle where we can index forward through the months as they happen and save the new information down to a new file. Now, right now we have these graphs down here set to show us year over year changes. So we can also see the seasonality of the business, but sometimes we want to compare our forecast against the budget. Well, right up here in this cell here, we have a graph toggle, which we're all also going to be showing you exactly how to build. We could pop into the graph toggle and toggle it over to budget and now we're seeing the current year against the budget. And finally in this course we're going to be teaching you a lot of keyboard shortcuts which will make you much faster in Microsoft Excel. For instance if we want to switch this back to years we just use the keyboard to do that really quickly. While most people think about financial models as being tools to help with quantitative analysis, we also discuss the importance of qualitative analysis. And for this reason, we've put this section down in here where we can provide commentary for the stakeholders after we've gone through and analyzed the monthly data. A lot of careful planning has gone into the design and creation of this model template and this course, and we're so excited to be sharing it with you. In this course, you're going to be able to understand exactly how we approach model design, why we've designed this model the way we have, and also all of the interesting Excel formulas and functions that we've used to make this all happen. So this course is going to give you a chance to understand FP&A model design, hone your Excel skills, and also practice keyboard shortcuts to make yourself more efficient. We're really excited that you've been able to join us for this course. Let's jump ahead now to the next video and do a proper tour of this model template. So this course called FPNA Professionals Model Build and Configuration is actually the first course in a series of three courses in total. Each one of these three FPNA courses will all be using this same financial model that we're looking at right now. Going through these three courses in order makes a lot of sense since you'll be following the same order that we use to build this particular financial model. So we really hope to see you in each one of these three FPNA courses. Now let's jump in and get started. So we wanted to give you a quick tour of the model template that we're going to be building. A lot of really neat features in here that we're really excited to share with you. Now the first feature to show you is right here where we can set the first forecast here which we've set as 2025. When we set that to 2025, it dynamically flows all the way down to here to influence this label showing the 2025 forecast and also this label showing the 2026 forecast. So we're able to forecast up to 24 months into the future. Now the next thing to illustrate is actually back up here. We have the latest month of actuals in this cell and we can quickly get into the selection and select any month we want. As we do that, we can see the check boxes forming down here, showing that we have actuals now for March. Now, as we're toggling here for the month, we want to bring two things to your attention. Number one, we want you to notice that we have three months of actuals here, so we have automatically a checkbox appearing here for Q1. The other thing to watch is down here. We have a solid line now for three months indicating that these are actuals. The remainder of the year, which is the dotted line, is a forecast. Watch what happens when we index forward now to, say, June. 
we now have an extra checkbox here for Q2, and we have more solid area all the way across there on the graph. Just to test and show off this feature a little bit more, let's go forward to September. We can see a checkbox for Q3 in the graph updating, and now to December, and we can see checkboxes all the way across, and now also a checkbox has automatically appeared for the year, indicating that the actuals are complete, and we can see a solid line all the way across here on the chart. Now it's also worth noting that down here, this is where we're keeping track right in here of the actuals. And as the actuals come in, we're gonna be loading them month to month across here. But we also wanna keep track of our forward forecast. For example, if we were just in say, we had the actuals for March at this point, then these would be actuals loaded in here indicated by the checkbox. The remainder of the year is here, the forecast. Now what we're also always tracking is the current forecast here, as well as the previous forecast, because there are gonna be times when we may, may wanna change our forecast. We're tracking it so we can look at the variance and also the percentage change. Same thing down here for the 2026 forecast. We track the current, previous, show the variance, and the percentage change as well. Now the other feature to note here is that we're tracking our current year, 2025, always against the budget and showing year over year increases. We can show that we're ahead of the budget, which is great. And here we can show quite large year over year increases versus the previous year, which is 2024. Now the last feature to share with you is probably our favorite feature in this particular model or dashboard. Right up here, we have a graph toggle. Now right now the graph toggle is set to years, which is really convenient because we're seeing the current year 2025, or forecast into 2026, but we're also showing these previous years. And this is so helpful because we can graphically see the year over year increases. We can also see very clearly the seasonality in this business with higher sales in the summer months as it's selling into North America. So this is a great feature for forecasting, but sometimes we want to know how we're doing against the budget. So on the graph toggle here, we can quickly index over to budget. And now we're showing the current year 2025 versus the budget. As you can see, we're just ahead of the budget here in every month, according to our forecast, and out here for every quarter, and obviously just ahead of the budget here by year as well. So as we mentioned earlier, we're super excited to share these features with you. We hope that from this model tour, you're also getting excited to learn how to build and implement these into your own model template. The course is going to start by teaching you how to build these things, then what we're going to do is move into a simulation where we get data each month, we show you how to put the data into the model and save a new version of the file. We hope you're excited to get started. We'll see you soon. So in this quick video, we want to talk about the design of this model, since it may be very different from financial models that you've seen in the past. Now, a lot of financial models would have a number of different tabs. For example, you may have one tab entitled inputs, where you would obviously put all the inputs for the financial model. Then you may have a model tab where you're doing all of the formulas or calculations. And finally, you may have a separate tab for outputs where all the dashboards and charts would be located. Well, as you can see, this financial model is different. Over here, we simply have a cover page, and then we have one tab entitled model. So given that we only have one tab entitled model, we essentially have everything on this tab. We have all the inputs, we have all of the calculations and formulas, and we have all of the outputs or charts. So by design, we have everything all together on one tab. And the reason for this is we want to be able to load in our data down here where you see blue font. These are obviously the inputs. But as we load in that data, we need and want to be able to see the charts. That way, as we're loading the data in here, we can see how things look in terms of year over year growth versus the history. We can also see very clearly the seasonality of the business. Now, I hope you can agree that if you were to just glance only at these numbers without the charts and glance at these numbers down here, it would be very, very difficult for you to see year-over-year -year growth or seasonality. But with these charts up here, we can obviously look very quickly. We can see consistent year-over-year -year growth through history here. We can also see the seasonality of the business repeated every single year. Now we're also showing the audience the same year-over-year -year growth over here on a quarterly basis, as well as the seasonality. We can see how things have been growing year-over-year -year in terms of the annual results over here. Now the other thing that we've included in this financial model is over here. You can see that there's some commentary around 
the monthly results, the 2025 forecast, and the 2026 forecast. The idea is that the financial models are very good at conveying quantitative information, but here we've given some qualitative results here to describe exactly what happened during the month and what we see going forward. Now, building like this obviously takes up a lot of room. All that we're looking at on this schedule is volume. Below this, we would have a price schedule, and below that, a revenue schedule. So this is obviously going to take up quite a bit of room. If each of these schedules is using about 50 rows, if we start multiplying this out across an entire financial model, it's going to go down for hundreds, if not thousands of rows. So our advice here would be don't worry about using a lot of rows and having a tall vertical stack. There's over a million rows in Excel, and guess what? They're free. When you buy the software, you get all those rows included. You may be using up a lot of rows and have a very tall vertical stack for your financial model, but the huge advantage here is as you put numbers into the model, you're going to be able to see the charts immediately and use those charts to help you make decisions. The decisions that we're gonna be making is, we're gonna be analyzing the figures as they come in and then deciding on whether or not we need to update our financial forecasts into the future. So we really just wanted to bring your attention to this model design and really the importance of being able to see the charts plotted as we're making changes to the numbers so we can decide whether or not we need to update our financial forecasts. Now the next step is gonna be for you to download the model template in the next video, we're going to get started on guiding you through just how to build this dynamic financial model for yourself. We'll see you there. Now, as you can see here, we have the model template open. If you didn't get a chance to download the template files in the last section, please go back and download the files. Come back and meet us here. Now, the first place for us to get started is right across here. We want to show the months January through December in these cells. We're going to start right in here with the first one and use a date function. We would ask that you please build this into your template as well. We're going to type in equals D-A-T-E, open the bracket. We can see it's looking for the year, month, and the day. Well, the year is going to be dynamic, and we're going to get it from the forecast year right here, 2025. Put in a comma. Now we're going to hard code the month as one and also hard code the day as one. So this is going to return January 1st, 2025. Let's hit enter. Now this is definitely a full date, January 1st. 2025, but we have it formatted just as J-A-N. Now, the way we've done that, if you're curious, just pop into the cell and tap Control-1, which is the Format Cells shortcut. And we can see right in here that we're forecasting, or we're formatting this, excuse me, as M-M-M. That gives us J-A-N for the month of January, and we're not indicating the day or the year, and then we just have an underscore right bracket, which puts an invisible right bracket on the right-hand side for spacing. Now what we want to do is start indexing forward to February, March, but we want to keep the same day of the month. The formula that's perfect for that is the e-date formula. Let's type in equals e-date. And no, this is not where you set up your online dating profile to meet other Excel enthusiasts. What this does do is we can select a start date, which is going to be this date over here in this cell, put in a comma, and for the months, we're going to say one, which will index the date forward one month to February 1st, 2020, 25. We can hit enter now. The next step is going to be simple. Let's pop into this cell and do a copy. Control C. We're going to highlight across using the shift key and alt E S which brings up a paste special. Use the down arrow to get to formulas and hit enter. Perfect. Now something that we covered in a previous FP&A course, but we just like to bring it to your attention if you're curious, is the way that we're getting Q1, 2, 3, and 4 in here. We're actually using a choose function in conjunction with the month. So we're extracting the month from the date below, and then we're defining the choose function as being Q1 here, followed by Q2, 3, and 4. So what's physically in these cells here? are just one, two, three, four. And we have them formatted, as you can see, with a Q in front of them like this, and that same underscore right bracket for spacing. Now, the way that we've done the labels over here is similar in terms of format. These are formatted in the same way, with the Q in the front, proceeding. What we have in here physically, if we tap F2, it's just a one. What are we doing in the next cell? Well, we're just adding one to it and doing the same all the way across. Over here where it says year, 
is simple. This is just a text label indicating that we have the annual amounts over there. So we hope you're enjoying things so far. Now that we have these months all set here, what we're going to do is put a nice drop down selector here so the user can select the months from that list. We'll see you there. So what we want to do now is focus our attention on this box. This is where we want the user to input the latest month of actuals that are available. But we want to limit their options. Effectively, we want it to limit the options only to these months here. We can do that with data validation. If you haven't seen data validation before, you're in for a treat. Let's get started. So the first step, and this is what we'd ask you to do, is please hop over into this cell, which is E5. We need to be in the cell that the data validation is going to go in. Now we want to expand the Excel ribbon. We can do that by hitting Control Shift F1, just like this. Now that the Excel ribbon is open, we can use the keyboard. Let's tap the Alt key together. All these letters appear. We want the data section of the ribbon, so that's gonna be an A. We'll tap A next. Now more letters appear. We wanna get over here to data validation, so that's gonna be a V. Let's tap the V. And now we need to tap another V for data validation. This dialog box opens up. Once again, that shortcut was Alt A V V. So let's continue with the keyboard to see if we can do this exclusively without using the mouse. Now we want to hit the tab key, gets us down to this allow box here. Now we're going to use the down arrow to go down to list. And in fact, once we've got to list, we can hit the tab key again. That gets us down to this source input page here. Now for the source, if you could please select from this cell, use control shift right arrow to select all the way across. So you have all 12 months and then hit enter. Now you may have noticed that a little drop down arrow here appears on the right of this cell. Most people would click on the mouse to access this to grab one of the months. But in fact, many people don't know you can do this with the keyboard. The way to do it if you're in this cell is just hit Alt down. You get access to this and you can use the up and down arrows to select any month you want. We're going to select April and just hit enter like that. Now the way that we use data validation is by selecting from a list. And in fact, this is the most common way that data validation gets used. You often want to restrict users to a specified list for what they can input into a certain cell. Now that we've completed that, we can collapse the Excel ribbon again. It's that same shortcut, Control Shift F1, just like this. The next video, we're going to focus our attention across here. We want to get little check boxes in place showing us how many months of actuals that we have. For instance, we've selected April, so we would like check boxes to appear for these first four months. We'll see you there. Continue learning. Join CFI today.